Welcome to this Way to Fire YouTube video where today it's me, Andy, and I'll just be looking through the new Shackos and Bayonets expansion for Muskets and Tomahawks from Studio Tomahawk. So Studio Tomahawk uh, is a French company that has produced such iconic games as Saga and uh, has also done Muskets and Tomahawks some years ago and a new edition came out about 18 months ago. This is the new edition. You will need this to play. And then they initially came out with their French Indian Wars, uh, North American expansion, also covered a War of Independence and War of 1812. This was quite a thin version, uh, and you can see my front cover has been bent because of that. But it was really good, high quality production value, um, beautiful glossy paper inside, really, really nice. And similarly in the actual main rulebook as well, you can see um, it's fantastically laid out. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole of this because there are plenty of other videos out there and it's been out for a little while now. If people want, I guess I can do one. Um, but at the moment I'm just going to talk about the Shackos and Bayonets expansion. So this has just come out in the last few months and this is for the Napoleonic Wars. So I'm um, quite a fan of that part of history. So if you like, you know, sharp and stuff like that, then this is for you. Um, it's a little bit uh, thicker card than the last one. So spine's a bit better. Um, still high quality, high color. Uh, what is there, about 80 pages in this book. Um, I'm gonna start with the very first thing that annoys me. Um, this is a picture from, uh, I think, probably a Charville or a Brown Bess from a museum. Uh, but they've put smoke on it. How can you put smoke on it? It kind of fired, could it? Because it's got no flint. It's got no fleet flint in the dragon's teeth here to actually cause the spark. I know it's a silly little thing. I know it is, but it annoys me. Um, I do like this, though. It's a nice Edouard Detal um, painting here of a uh, French... Dragoon capturing an Austrian flag by the looks of it. Um, well, anyway, let's get straight into it. So, we have the usual sort of background stuff. And then we go straight into looking at different uh, rules for certain nations. So we've got the main nations in this book are France, British and Portuguese, because they did uh, actually, the British reorganised the Portuguese army. And so they sort of follow very similar doctrine. Uh, Russians, Prussians, Spanish and Austrians and then they've got this minor nations category which sort of covers everybody else so um, whether it be the Netherlands, whether it be uh, Hess, uh, the other G minor German states, Bavaria, stuff like that so all covered in here. Um, they talk about a few new traits which are specific for this uh, game rather than in the previous version so we've got a new weapon Jaegers here we've got different types here impetuous fearless and then the different troop types and there are is a card set that comes with this which I'll show you in a moment different talents here as well so there's different things um, based on um, so certain line infantry can gain your land, especially like uh, cavalry, vanguard. So there's a few more differences there because there's more cavalry and more organised fighting in this supplement than there is in the French Indian Wars one. They give you the usual generic units as well. So you've got civilians and you've got sailors who can be used by any uh, army or can be sort of uh, third party uh, in, a, in a battle. There's a little bit of history, which is great, showing you some of the major campaigns um, and a map of Europe. Doesn't cover some of the other campaigns of, say, uh, Egypt and so on, things like that, but obviously most of this was happening in Europe. There was a little bit in North America as well, War of 1812, as I mentioned before. Um, again, just a little bit more through. If you know the period, you won't need any of that. And then we get here onto the French army itself. So, again, wonderful pictures in here. These are all Perry miniatures, I think, but they've, what I really like about this is they've got a huge number of different manufacturers' miniatures represented with all high-quality, high-gloss um, pictures really really beautiful um, and these are the lists so everyone has an officer as an option these are sort of set at sort of company level I guess so we've got a French officer here you can make him a grenadier you can make him imperial guardsman you can make him a voltigier a light infantry um, cantinier 
I like that, that's a nice touch to add a cantonier, that model that you've always wanted to use and never have had a reason to, you can add a cantonier to a unit. Fusiliers and chasseurs, so that's line and light infantry, so they have this general thing, so here's the normal general line infantry unit, and then what you can do is you can make them chasseurs, so this is a different type of light infantry that fought in formed up formations. And then you've got the Grenadiers and Carabinier, which are elite and light infantry companies. And uh, this names are slightly different for different things, don't worry about that too much. Um, different regiments call them different things. Um, because Voltigiers would be the equivalent of a light infantry for some other units. Um, there is a really annoying, and I'm, I imagine Studio Tomahawk are really annoyed as well, that they're they've made a lot of effort to translate this from French to English of course but something has gone wrong in the type setting I think at the publisher because Grenadiers has this it just doesn't come out right it's got this AE together which I think is a French um, word instead of a um, A and then D so that's really disappointing I'm sure they're very frustrated about that because uh, it, lets, it lets it down the actual book's really good at hardly typos at all but this is a little annoying and it's throughout so it must be just the way it's been put in in the um by the printer i think there's another annoying one as well in that dragoons here is uh done similarly it's a should be an a and then g of course but it's got this uh c strange c thing which i don't understand because it's a different language one uh, the other one cheval Guerre and chasseur cheval is fine because you know that's how you would write them in english anyway um because you just copy over the word so anyway infantry of the imperial guard we've got those and what you get is you get a base cost for the number let's have a look at those actually so you get a base cost for the number of models six models at 98 points he had up to six additional figures for 16 points each and then you can change some of the options for so you can make them old guard gaining the fearless trait for 20 points for the unit Chasseurs of the Imperial Guard get uh, change them to light rather than close order, and they're five points per unit. Voltigeurs of the Imperial Guard it actually saves you some points, um, and then you change them down to skirmishers. So a lot of different units going to have extra models added to them, but you can see that most units are going to be in the region of infantry maximum of about twelve models, and cavalry somewhere between six and eight models really. Well, those dragoons can be a little bit. Um, they can be a little bit. Dragoons are interesting actually because you can have larger units, you know, up to 12 cavalry, but you can put them on foot as well, which would be a nice touch if you want to sort of make them skirmish through a Spanish village or something like that. Um, we've also got Dragoons, Imperial Guard, Cuirassier, and Carabinier. So all the different types of cavalry are covered. Artillery, maybe artillery shouldn't really be in a skirmish game, but you know, it has a place, I think. Um, National Guard, so these are later on when France was actually invaded by the other um, nations. These are sort of your uh, um, poor quality, rapidly raised troops of young young men and old men. Young boys and old men. Uh, and then we go on to Britain. So when it says Britain, what it means is Great Britain and its dependencies, of course. So um, we're really focusing very much on Europe here, so there's no sepoys, for instance. Um, but we start again with a British officer. You can make that British officer give them different traits, uh, make them light infantry, or um, put them on horseback. Then you get your line infantry here, British line, which again starts as eight and you have up to 12 figures. So slightly bigger than the French units, I think they were. I can't remember actually. Um, you got your light infantry. So these are normal light uh, infantry would be um, light companies. So every, um, every regiment would have a number of centre companies and then some flank companies and some grenadier and a grenadier company. So you can have your, uh, your grenadiers um, and your light companies can also be here or you can independently have light companies. Highlanders are given slightly different rules as they often are because they're sort of portrayed as being more aggressive for Highlanders. Um, British Guards, again, you can have those if you want. Um, they, guards were in, the Guards fought in most of the British uh, battles of this period as well. Uh, riflemen, everybody's favourite, British Rifles. So this would be, say, your 95th Rifles or your 60th Rifles in their interestingly green uniform and, of course, popularised with the sharp novels and TV shows. Hussars and light dragoons, and then heavier dragoons here, um, artillery, and then interestingly they've got the Portuguese in here, so they're all part and parcel of the same army, so you can have a Portuguese officer, 
and then you can have different types of Portuguese infantry. Fusiliers, chasseurs, um, cazadors, which are here, and cavalry as well, and artillery. So again, really nice touch to have the Portuguese in amongst that. Moving on, we've got the Prussian army now. So Prussian army, very interesting. Um, not as colourful as some of the other armies, um, but had some massive ups and downs during the course of the Napoleonic Wars, I think it's fair to say. Um, big problems recruiting, so again they have the officer here, they have the musketeers, grenadiers and reservists. So they're all basically the same, but you can change their quality by uh, these extra points. Fusiliers and Schützen, Schützen just means riflemen. So they're light infantry. And then we've got Jaegers which are another light infantry here, you can see about top of their green uniforms. And then Hussars and Erlans, which are Lancers, Dragoons, Cuirassiers, the heavy um, cavalry and artillery again. We've also got um, Landwehr or Freikorps, so this would be the um, very much the reservists. Um, not very well trained, you can see they're very cheap, so eight, eight figures up to an extra six, so taking you to 14 if you want, but they were badly trained, so there's a lot of minuses that you can have here. I mean, they start with cowardly as a trait. You can pay extra points to, to get rid of cowardly. Um, they have cavalry and uh, as well, and then we have the Spanish army. So we mentioned the Portuguese was independent, but actually the Spanish, uh, I think these might be front rank miniatures up here, not quite sure. Um, and again, similar sort of format. They get a priest as an option, which is quite an interesting one being a, a very devoutly Catholic country. Um, and they had their Cazadors as well, so their light infantry, the specialists, riflemen. Uh, again, the usual types of cavalry, artillery, and guerrillas. So you can actually make a list just of guerrillas. So again, this is weird thing here, that should be leader, of course, so it's just a bit annoying, but um, I don't blame the guys at Studio Tomahawk, really. I think it's just unfortunate. It's very obvious what it is. And the Austrians, I have a soft spot for the Austrians, I'm going to be honest. I don't know what it is. Uh, these are Perry miniatures, I think, in this picture. So the Austrian army, they were, they were, they kept coming back for more, let's put it that way. And Napoleon Wars, they don't, never really seem to be um, on the winning side that often. Um, they have quite large units, 16 models potentially, and they're usually units, skirmishers, grenadiers, grenzers, which is a particular type of light infantry. Landwehr again, and then the usual sort of heavy cavalry options. Um, yeah, very good. I like that. Moving on to the Russians. Again, I think they're Perry ones, those ones, but there are some other models in here as well. And a similar sort of thing musketeers, grenadiers, Jaegers. So they're very similar styles, but they, you know, most of the armies are going to, their base troops are going to be quite similar. What they do have here is they have Cossacks as an option as well. So you can run different Cossacks. I'm very tempted to pick up some for the retreat from Moscow, some of these sort of cool models. You don't need masses of them, so it's a way of expanding into a new period or into a new line of or faction um, relatively cheaply. Cheaply. Uh, I'm going to say this wrong. Opolchny. Is that right? No idea. Uh, it's a type of militia, sort of town militia. And then we get onto the minor nations at the end. So you get a generic officer option, lion infantry, grenadier, light infantry options, light cavalry and normal cavalry, and then artillery. So again, this was a French word uh, rather than the English version, but again, it's fine. Um, I think that's, Ita that's actually Italian at the top there, but they would count as French, these ones anyway, because they're... They would have fought in the French army in a French style. So um, you've got a few different ways of changing these to give you a lot of freedom of what to do. Some beautiful other miniatures at the end, beautifully painted miniatures. And then the scenarios. So the scenarios, um, they allow you to either use the standard ones from the uh, Muskets and Tomahawks rulebook, or you can use some from the uh, French Indian War expansion. And then they add extra ones as well. And what I really like here is that not only have you got a bunch of different scenarios of different sizes, so some are for bigger games, some for smaller games, but also you can change things like the weather, um, and there's you know quite a lot of different rules here. See again, so there's another one here. This should be wagons, but wagons. 
it's just disappointing. And this is the cargo, so this is just one mission, so you can see how expansive this could be. Uh, here's another one, the final hour, so this is at the end of a, at the end of a battle. And again, the weather you can use, so you can make it really um, hot, so as if you're in Spain, or you can make the snow falling, as if you're in Russia. I really like that element. The assault, so this is a larger battle. Um, Heart of the Inferno. And there's some battle events in here, some random events that can happen as well. So that's four additional scenarios on top. And then these are the random events at the back as a table of those. This uses a D10, this game system. So that's why you can see that these are running D10s. Um, and there we go. And it's the 82nd uh, Eagle, which I think is in Edinburgh Castle, I think. I think it's one that was captured by the British at Waterloo. I can't quite remember. So yeah, really, really nice. Four new scenarios. Um, lists for France, Britain, stroke, uh, Portugal, uh, Prussia, Spain, Austria, Russia, and then the generic list. I really like this book. It's a nice, tidy little book. Really great to complement uh, Muskets and Tomahawks earlier stuff, which was focused predominantly on French Indian Wars, and the first version was entirely on French Indian Wars. In their core rulebook, they've suggested they will also be doing um, other ones for maybe American Civil War and other Victorian or Colonial Wars, such as um, the Indian Mutiny. They've got pictures of those in their core book, so I suspect that they will plan for those in the future. There is a card deck that comes with it. That's an essential part of it. Um, I'll get that now. And this is my deck of cards. So comes with uh, just a cover thing. And then these are different, these are activation cards, so these, when these come up different things happen. And then you have a blue and a red set of cards. So I'll just look at the red one. So you get the cards depend on what you're taking, so they're written in French at the top and English at the bottom. They're all the same backing so you can't tell. Uh, so if the artillery cards up then you can act with your artillery. There's a couple of those. Light like cavalry cards, so there's different numbers of these depending on, so more light cavalry cards, so more chances they will come up and be able to act. Normal cavalry or line cavalry or heavy cavalry. Civilians, if you have those in a mission. Line infantry. Militia. And if you didn't have the militia, you wouldn't put the cards in a deck. Irregulars. So you can see there's more types than there are in the French, uh, French Indian Wars. And light infantry, and that is your different types. And the blue ones are exactly the same. They're just exactly the same. Um, they've got the same art and everything, so it's not a problem in the slightest. Oh, I missed, a, uh, yeah, I missed a couple of cards there. So actually, there's two more cards, which are really important. These are general cards. You always have these in deck. So a morale card and a forward boys card, which is for your officer to do extra things. And they can change out the way the uh, scenario plays quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I actually really like these cards. They're nice. They're a good size. They will be sleeveable. Uh, they're a little bit thin, but they're not bad. They're much better than the first edition ones. They've got rounded corners as well, which makes uh, shuffling them much, much easier. And like I said, they've all got the same back, so you can't tell. Very nice. So in the UK, you can get the Shackers and Bayonets um, expansion for about £20, and the card deck as another £10. So it's not... It's normal pricing, really. I mean, I think that's fine. £30 for the... Um, core book and the cards but of course you will need the actual rule book as well this hardback rule book which is going to set you back 24 pounds extra so if you were getting in straight off you would have to buy the rule book the expansion book and the deck that's going to cost you about 55 pounds which does seem a decent amount but actually it's not that bad and you've got to remember i think that Companies like this, like Studio Tomahawk, um, a bit like they do with their Saga game, they don't produce miniatures, they just produce the rules. So the only income they're getting is from the additional bits. And I have quite a lot of different um, faction dice for Saga, for instance, and I may not even play those factions, but um, you know, you're sort of giving a little bit back to the company by supporting them in that way. It's not like they've got a range of miniatures to support. So I don't think that's a bad price in this day and age for a rule set. And actually, certainly for Napoleonics these days, picking up um, Perry or War Games Atlantic or War Games Found, uh, sorry, not War Games Found, um, Warlord Miniatures plastic sets, you can actually get a force on the table for pretty darn cheap, probably less than the, the rule book, to be honest. You know, a couple of boxes will get you everything you would need for, um, for one army, for sure. 
Um, so yeah, I think as an outlay, it's not expensive at all. So uh, I will be doing some battle reports at some point coming up for Shackles and Bayonets for sure. Uh, and I'm looking forward to playing it. I really am. So thanks very much for watching, everyone. Please check out our other videos. Listen out for the Way to Fire podcast. Come join us on the Way to Fire Facebook page and the Way to Fire Hobby Hangout, where you can post up everything that you've been working on, and we can all chat about these great games that we love and play. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.